Next up, on the Cosmic News Network, First Contact, with Joshua Putt. Today is Wednesday, it's the 24th of August, 2016. Our sun sign is in Virgo. This is the representation of a Virgo in the tarot card, just a hermit. It is an earth sign. It deals with the idea of the physical world, physical body, being patient, because in the physical world things move at a certain pace, so we have to be patient. And this is also advances that idea that when we're down here on Earth, we need to be teachers. We need to teach each other. We need to help each other. So we have the lantern that's being held high in order to be able to shine the light of information to others. And in this day and age, we certainly have the ability for a lot of people to be teaching. Look at the social networks that are out there. Look at what's going on with YouTube, the number of people that are doing their own podcasts, their own shows. It's, it's quite a lot of teaching out there, so that's really awesome. And so with this time, things keep moving up, and uh, we keep seeing like think time is speeding up, our in knowledge is increasing, more and more teaching is going on. And then, of course, our moon sign is in Taurus at the present time. Taurus, representative of the Hierophant, reminding us that we need to bring the spiritual down into the physical. Okay, we can't just live in the physical because that doesn't get us anywhere except just in the physical. And then we feel trapped when we allow ourselves to connect to higher power. Then we are truly freed up because that higher power is what flows through us to make all things move accordingly. The aspects we're looking at today, we've got an aspect with Mars, which is the planet that energizes things is in conjunction at this time with Saturn. Saturn is discipline. So we have all of this energy, but we need to focus it. Okay, we have this energy that's coming through, but we need to focus it, be disciplined with it, and how we are going to progress with it. When we get to 8.21 a.m., uh, we have Chiron jumps into the mix with Taurus, and Chiron wants us to look at the part of ourselves that needs to be healed. Okay, is there something in us that needs to be healed? If so, let's take a look at it. Let's get her done. As we get into the evening, we could see that we go void of course at 2.38 p.m., which is the last aspect of Taurus, and then we don't go into the next sign until 6.40 p.m. when the moon goes into uh, Gemini, which will be the next sign here. I got it upside down here, but that is Gemini. And Gemini is a reminder, tarot card of the lovers is the card that represents this. Okay, it's all about the choices that we make. So the unconscious desire now goes from an earthly sign into an air sign. Air is all about the ways in which we express ourselves. So we're going to be looking for this expression. And the expression is made through the choices that we make. The better information we have, the better the choices we make. So when we take and combine these ideas of the things we're learning and teaching with the choices we're making, when we have better information, it all kind of goes hand in hand. Better information equals better choices, and so on. And then as we get later into the evening, uh, once again, what is this? can't really see this too good here. What is that? Chiron. Looks like Chiron again. Healing. And then finally, 10.41 p.m. And this is Chiron coming in here in opposition with Venus, our imagination. So, again, think of this as a teeter-totter. Whenever you see the oppositions, imagination on one side, the part that needs to be healed on the other, 
we want to find a way to make that work so they can both be in balance with each other use our imagination to heal the part of ourselves that needs to be healed and then finally 10:41 p.m. the sun and the moon are going to square off there's a lesson to be learned there between Gemini and Virgo and that lesson is information equals better choices so we're going to really have to take a good hard look at the information we are getting and how we are receiving it and how we're processing it as well the moon phase is a waning moon it's going back down to the new moon new moon will be here September 1st which it's hard to believe it's that that soon it's already a, a week from tomorrow will be the first of September so right now we are here in the waning moon 56.2 percent of the way there on the Jewish calendar today is 20 Av 20 Av is the date year 5776 the daily thought together even if all the Jewish people worshiped idols but lived together in peace the sages taught God would not punish them all the more so when they are united in a good cause that oneness is a receptacle wide enough for open miracles. Okay, so just the idea of us working together is very important. Working together rather than working separately. And finally, space weather or solar wind 525.1 kilometers per second. Planetary K index, quiet at the moment, but we are going to be hitting a storm now, over the next 24 hours. It's a 5. So if things feel a bit intense, energy seems to be amplified, there would be a good reason for it. We are hitting a storm. The coronal holes here, we still got this one on the top. Look like there's something on the bottom, a little over here to the left. Again, indications we are going to be hit on the 30th with some wind from there. Both flare possibilities of X and M are low, 1%. Geomagnetic storm activity, mid-latitude seems to be decreasing a bit. 35 to 25, dropping down to 20 to, to 5. In the upper latitudes, things are stable. So things lower energy as that it's moved, energy is moved from above down to the earth. It seems that if uh, things are increasing while things up high, just kind of shows you how things move and the breathing that goes back and forth back and forth the energy moves down and it moves up and it moves down and then it moves up so there you go UFO news is up next this is the UFO news with Joshua poet all right Dirk thank you very much Today, I have four good stories. Four good stories for you. First story here comes to us from Colorado, or actually Russia. Glowing UFO in Russia over Farmer's Field, same as Colorado, Vegas. We have this light. We've just seen this recently. This was back in July, but it was just reported in August. It says the glowing UFO was seen during the daytime in Russia a few months back. But the person uploaded to YouTube this week. It shows a UFO moving low over the field and then beyond some trees. Not sure why the camera is held sideways or that he didn't move around the tree, but we do hear him attempting to move through leaves and then he gives up. Perhaps moving to the left was impossible, so he could only move to the right but was blocked by the trees. This UFO is very similar in appearance to the glowing orbs seen in Colorado mountains over the Colorado mountains and over the Las Vegas mountains. I see no difference in the color or intensity of the light. This is the same, but has never been seen so close. It is, however, been seen by UFO researcher in Vegas, Stephen Barone, who watches them almost nightly and records the unprecedented uh, and unpredictable intense UFOs. So, okay, so there you go. Wow, that's pretty right sighting there very interesting so what are these bright lights that are being seen these bright orbs are showing up in several places this isn't the first and there you have it ok 
Kansas, we have another object in the sky. Looks kind of orb-like. This was from the fourth of the month, reported to MUFON. The UFO was seen over a small town of Abilene a few weeks ago. Abilene is a secluded town with a low population of 6,600. So aliens probably thought the odds of being seen are much lower in this particular area. Looking for us, they were wrong. Aliens are not perfect. They do they do make mistakes and are seen from time to time daily around the planet. They may live thousands or even millions of years, but that doesn't make them gods, just immortals who are more fortunate than us technologically. All right, this person here this that spotted this says, I was on a walk in a local park when I noticed an odd light moving in the sky over me. I was able to record the object for about a minute. After the first object was out of sight, two other cameras appeared heading, two other objects appeared heading in the same direction, but too far out of range for my camera to see them. There's our object in question. Definitely something flying in the sky. It's not a lens flare. It is certainly an object. Question is, what is that? What indeed is that? And there it looks like it's disappearing as it gets behind the clouds. And there it is again. All right, so the video link is available, firstcontactradio.com. Check it out. Crop circle. Another crop circle popped up, this one near Chicholm Ranges, New Hampshire. This was on August 3rd. And we have a circle with a square in the middle of it. Circle with a square in the middle of it. Not sure what that represents, but definitely much food for thought in that regard. Circle with the square inside. And finally, one last story going back to a sighting and an incident that happened 36 years ago. Aussie farmer may hold clue to the 36-year Valentich UFO airplane mystery. A recent photograph may reveal or may shed light on the mysterious disappearance of civilian pilot Frederick Valentovich over Australian waters coast 36 years ago. Investigators have shed new light on one of Miss Australia's greatest aviation mysteries. Almost 36 years to the month that Victorian pilot French Valentich disappeared without a trace. An independent researcher says there is evidence suggesting that the 20-year-old Cessnas was spotted in the sky over South Australia attached to a UFO. The Victorian UFO Action Group wants help to identify a farmer near Adelaide who reportedly witnessed the 30-meter craft hovering over his property that morning after Mr. Valentich went missing. It is claimed that the Cessna was struck in the side of the craft, leaking oil. The farmer even scratched the plane's registration number onto his tractor, but never came forward with the information because he was ridiculed by a few friends, he told. The theory has sparked numerous debates over the, as to the nation's leading UFO investigators prepare for a national conference in Melbourne next month. Lead investigator George Simpson, one of the last people to see the plane in the sky, says that the farmer, if still alive, might have information to solve this mystery. He conceded there was no proof, but he said that the best new lead that the case had intrigued Australians for decades is easy for some to dismiss, but there are corroborating stories confirming that there was a UFO near Adelaide at that time, Mr. Simpson said. Mr. Valentich had been a routine cargo flight to King Island in October 1978 when he disappeared. In his last conversation with air traffic control, he reported an object hovering in front of him and said it was not an aircraft. It was the last thing Mr. Valens had said before a strange metallic clicking sound was heard and then the transmission stopped. Extensive searches failed to find any trace of the plane or the pilot. This was an experienced pilot who should have been able to identify another aircraft was clearly unable, Mr. Simpson said. Adding to the mystery, an amateur photo taken in the area that evening shows a dark, unidentifiable shape in the sky. Investigators are trying to find a copy of Valentich's final transmission that was originally aired on Melbourne radio station 3XY. The Valentich case will be among a string of Aussie X-Files to be discussed when the Victorian UFO Action Group hosts its Age of Reason conference on September 6th.
right. It's the Valentich. You got more information. You go here. Find out about the Victorian uh, case. And that, my friends, is our UFO news for today. I'm going to jump away as always. Line things up for the next go round. There we go. What if our government was responsible for some of the greatest crimes against this nation? Would you really want to know? These are big questions, but these questions deserve answers. It's time to demand the truth. Continue on. Continuing on. So, you may have heard, or maybe not, but there was a huge earthquake that took place in Italy yesterday, 6.2 magnitude. And the mayor says the town isn't there anymore. There are dozens of victims, many under the rubble. A 6.2 magnitude earthquake rocked the swath of central Italy and destroyed four small villages, popular with tourists early Wednesday burying residents under rubble as they slept and killing at least 63 people, including two infants. More than 100 are missing and believed to be trapped under the debris. The trembler hit at 3.36 a.m. local time near Norica, 50 miles southeast of Paruga, and was felt more than 100 miles away in Rome. As many as 39 aftershocks sheltered the region in the early morning hours, some strong as 5.1. The worst affected towns were believed to be Acamoli, Amatrice, Posta, and Araca del Tonto, reported Reuters. Among the hardest hit was Amatrice, a village of 2,000 north of Italy's Lazo region. The entire palazzo's raised to the ground. Aerial images from the fire department show that the whole streets are flattened. The town isn't there anymore, said Mayor Sergio Pirizzo. There are so many dead I can't make an estimate, he told Rai State Television. We have already extracted several dead bodies, but we do not know how many there are below. There are dozens of victims, many under the rubble. We are setting up a place for the bodies. Amatrice is known for famous all Amatricia Pista and its 14th century religious landmarks. The town was preparing for a festival held every year on the final Sunday in August to celebrate the dish. It's all young people here. It's a holiday season. The town festival was to have been held the day after tomorrow. So lots of people came for that. The Amatrice resident, Giancarlo, sitting in the road just in his underwear. It's terrible. I'm 65 years old. I've never experienced anything like this. Small tremors, yes, but nothing this big. This is a catastrophe. The whole ceiling fell. Did not hit me, said resident Maria Guiana. I just managed to put a pillow on my head, and I wasn't hit. Luckily, just injured my leg. So our thoughts and our prayers go out to the people of Italy. That's a pretty horrific earthquake there. Pretty horrific earthquake. You know, there's lots of earthquakes seems to be hitting lately. 
I'm going to bring up, well, let me show you right now the earthquake map here. This is earthquakes in the last 48 hours. You could see there's a lot of them. You could see how many are hitting central Italy. You know, look at all these. There are small ones in there. There's 4.4 one in Alaska. We've got a 2.5 in Nevada. Myanmar had a 6.8. Northern Columbia, Alaska again, Slovenia had an earthquake of 4.9 in the South Indian Ocean. There's lots and lots of earthquakes going on. So what's the cause of all of these earthquakes? Not quite certain, but they're happening and people are definitely being affected by them. So you know, it's always a good idea to be prepared for something like this. On one hand, you know, you want to be prepared. The other hand, what are you going to do if there's a major quake that happens? Probably the best thing you could do is just have some sort of bug out bag. So that if something did have to happen and you did have to get out in a moment's notice because of something catastrophic, at least you then, you know, are not having to run out empty handed. You know, you have a quick backpack or something handy, has an extra set of clothes, you know, some socks, underwear, you know, things that you might need in the case of an emergency. You know, think about other things, too, you might want to throw in, like if you might want to throw in an energy bar, something so that, you know, an emergency, you're able to maintain some sort of nutrition for your body. You know, throw in some water because... We know that the water systems could have problems to bottle water there. Just some basic things that you could have to be prepared and hopefully you'll never have to use them. But it's always a good idea just in case. You know, a little flashlight's always good. Power goes out, you want to have a flashlight. Maybe some a lighter, you know, something so that uh, if you're in a situation you have to make a fire, you have a, the ability to do that. You know, just simple little things we take for granted until something happens. And so I think it's important. There seems to be plenty of notification that we need to be on guard and alert for any strange things happening. And, you know, the people of Italy, they were caught off guard. They didn't expect that. And look at that, you know, all these people dying. So it's it's quite horrendous, quite horrendous. You know, look what happened in Louisiana, the flooding that occurred there. You know, that, that wasn't expected. And how many people, hundreds, thousands of people, they're, you know, out of their homes. And you look at what's going on in the streets there and all of their belongings piled up. You know, it's sad. It's sad to see all these things happen. But they're happening more and more often, more than we realize. And they're not always being reported. But I can guarantee you can go through on a daily basis and you can find that there's quite a lot of disasters taking place. Now... Some have theories about why this is, and one of these is about a astronomical body that's approaching our closer to our planet that causes some problems, and I'm talking about Nibiru. I haven't talked about Nibiru in a while. I thought it would be time to look at the subject again, simply because I'm seeing so much of it. I'm seeing so many reports of it, so I want to bring some of these to you to bring your attention to what is going on out there with Nibiru and just so you have that information if nothing else maybe you can you know follow along with the different uh, stories I show you and follow the links from there to the other stories that they present and just keep digging and research and see what you find and, you know if you find something share it with me you know cuz I'm just like you I'm looking for information to understand this better and better and we're all on this together, you know. We are all in this together. So here's a website. It's called Anunnaki.org. Anunnaki are the beings that are from Nibiru, as we are told. So let me just give a little synopsis here. This here, this ring here, is representative of the orbit of Nibiru. And here, right in the center here, is our Earth. Okay, and we have the planets and the stars moving around in the Earth, and then we have Nibiru, which comes in and out, just like so. 
and when it gets close inward it causes an effect upon our planet. From ancient Sumerian text there was a description of our creators that our creators came from a yet discovered planet that enters our solar system every 3600 years. The texts that were known as the Nephilim said they were known as the Nephilim and that they were colonizing the earth over 400,000 years ago. The Bible also mentions this race and calls them the sons of God. The planet of Niburu was suffering in its atmosphere. It was eroding, so they came to Earth in order to mine minerals, gold, brilliant, to help them repair their atmosphere. Well, this was done in the Middle East, and it's why we find the Great Pyramid and the adjacent pyramids in alone with constellations in our solar system. They created portals on Earth, highly magnetic areas to send their minerals back to Niburu. Our race was created around 300,000 years ago as a hybrid race with native Earth animals and the Nephilim to create a race of workers to help mine the minerals from our planet. The alien e leaders did not like this interbreeding and chose not to warm humankind at the impending doom on Nibiru in 1300 BC that eventually caused a great flood here on Earth. However, one of the Anunnaki takes it upon himself to inform Noah of the impending doom so that he can help avoid the race's extinction. From there, the Anunnaki promised to return in time to leave humans alone to rule our planet. Now, you have images here which show a couple of suns, two suns here. This was taken in late 2012. The reason two suns is because Niburu would have its own sun following with it, and therefore, as it moves closer into proximity with us, we see a second sun because it is the second sun of Niburu. Okay, in 20, 2002, the twelfth planet of Niburu physically entered our solar system, falling in line with Zechariah Sitchin's twelfth planet dialogue. After entering in 2002, Niburu went to influence the orbits of the planets in our system, changing their axis and poles along the way. And passed close to the Earth that it influenced our oceans for several years, eventually leading to devastating tsunamis, a new awakening of volcanoes around the world, and influenced definitely the climate and the Earth's axis, which slowly moves, thus altering the position of the physical and magnetic poles. Initially, the planet's orbit came close to the Earth's south pole and the Sun, and was not visible from the Earth. But late in 2012, the Buru's oblique orbit which was 35 relative to the solar equator plane, proved to be quite visible and many pictures and videos were posted online questioning this new star in our skies. However, no one in the mainstream media were asking these types of questions. Why is that? The short answer is because NASA, of NASA, NASA, I like to refer to it as never a straight answer, or the National Association of Space Actors, Either way you look at it, they decided to question the true orbit and return of Nibiru to our solar system. The U.S. government had urged them that it was required that they deny the existence of Nibiru in order to not cause widespread panic throughout the world. NASA then prepared a very well-built simulation that projected the orbit of Nibiru, transformed the simulation in video, and sneak released it on the Internet. The simulation done by NASA computers presented virtually not only the displacement of Nibiru in its orbit, but also the orbits of the planets of the solar system. All right, and here we see the orbit right around here. It's just as Zechariah talked about, the goal of the video was to clear for any scholar, confuse anyone with the false orbit path of Nibiru. The goal was accomplished as everyone thought there was nothing to be seen or any adverse effects of the Earth. Nibiru, by all definitions, concepts, and research scholars in the field, is a red or brown dwarf star that carries along with it seven planets orbiting around each other. Therefore, it is the mini solar system. Nibiru is close to five times the size of Jupiter, so by turn, it is 6,500 times larger than Earth. With a gigantic size, it is a very strong gravitational pull and its influence our oceans and all magnetic fields. So in 2011, when Nibiru approached the sun, it began forcefully pulling the sun's core. The core of the sun is about 65 times that of Nibiru. Thus, the solar activity in relation to explosions and solar storms had increased so much that the Maximo solar 
started in 2011 and has not stopped to this day. The emissions are in the ultraviolet sol solar radiation level, and currently at 15. Okay, so you can see there's a lot more to this. I want to jump up here. I want you to take notice of the different areas here. We got the Sumerian aliens, Naburu, Anunnaki in the Bible, Nephilim. So, in a nutshell, maybe I'll get more into this over the course of uh, tomorrow, but basically what we have here is we have these beings that have come from this planet, Naburu, that come down to Earth. Now the beings that have been coming down to Earth, as we are told, are those that we refer to as the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki came down to Earth 400,000 years ago in order to mine for gold because their planet was in a state of dire emergency. Their atmosphere was being affected. And so they came down to Earth to mine for gold. Now there's more to the story because we understand that up there on Diburu there were some challenges that were going on power struggles between the hierarchy and it ended up where this being Alulu ended up having a battle with King Anu and Alulu ended up being disposed down to earth came down to earth in a rocket where he discovered all of these different elements of gold that could assist with the planet of Naburu However, he also brought with him some nuclear weapons and threatened to shoot Naburu out of the sky. So there was a battle that ensued and beings came down from Naburu down to Earth. Enlil, Anki, Anu, they came down. Ultimately, Alulu was removed from the Earth. He ended up going up to Mars where he eventually left the life force behind where he died. So down here on Earth we had Enlil and Enki and Anu and Enlil and Enki, two half brothers. One of them was put in charge for a while of the earthly mission and the other one had to sit and watch but the other one became jealous of the other brother and so then he eventually took over. These two brothers were involved with the process of humankind, the creation of humankind through genetic engineering, taking one of the primate beings upon this planet and helping to evolve it into well, becoming a being that was a little bit more self-aware, that it could go and do some work for it. Not too self-aware, but just enough that it could be used as some sort of slave for them. So they were built as a being to mine. And so they were mining because the Anunnaki got tired of doing the mining for themselves. So all was going well, but these two brothers, Enlil and Enki, seemed to have an, a disagreement. Enlil wanted the being to remain subservient and slave-like. Enki didn't like that. Enki wanted them to be able to evolve and advance. And so therein was a power struggle. This power struggle we see worked out through the biblical story of the Garden of Eden. That's why you've heard me say that it's possible that the stories that we have of the Bible are combinations of these stories from the Sumerian mythology. We also have the stories of the non Kamadi library of Yaldabaoth being cast down to earth and then Yaldabaoth being involved with the creation of humankind. So when we look at the creation stories in these very mythologies, we have Yaldabaoth in one, we have Yahweh in another, and we have Enlil Enki in another. Well, all three of them are creating humankind, so it is quite possible we're talking about the same event, different names for the same being, and that over time the story was just repackaged. But if we look at the story, we have to go back to the oldest version of the story, which, of course, is the story of the Anunnaki, Enlil and Enki, two brothers fighting against each other. And one of the things that we've certainly known over the years and through our mythologies is there's been this battle between good and evil, light and dark, you know, a war between two brothers, two sides, 
that are at odds with each other. One that wants to suppress, one that wants to free up. And then within this mix, we also have this rebellion that occurred where a being known as Allah rebelled against Enlil and who quite possibly could be the representation in the Bible as Yahweh. They battled and Allah ended up being defeated, but nonetheless, there was this challenge for the throne there, the challenge for what he was doing. So all of these characters we're hearing about in this time, with Yahweh, Allah, you know, they're all present in these ancient stories that go back hundreds of thousands of years. So something more is going on. Something definitely more is going on. And so when we look at the Bible, I think it's, very important we understand that these are stories of people that were inspired by God most definitely but we can't rule out understanding that these same stories were edited together by men for the actual biblical book that we have the hard copy book they were edited together by men and these men had different agendas some wanted to express the truth of what they knew and others wanted to suppress the truth and that's been the battle back and forth with Enlil and Enki one wanted to have the truth out one wanted to suppress it and then we move forward through time and we see this played out over and over again all the way through the time where we have Jesus who wanted to express the truths and then you have the Pharisees who wanted to suppress the truths so when it came time for this council in Nicaea in 325 AD this was the battle going on. So you have a book, the Bible, that's put together of stories of people inspired by God, but men were the ones who finally edited this book. And I, knowing what I know, and you knowing what you know about the corruptions that occur when men in positions of power are given charge of something, we simply kind of put two and two together to understand that the Bible's probably been corrupted to some degree or another by these men. So in order to find the truth of God, we need to seek, because it might not be there right on the very surface. And what is the message we're told over and over from Jesus? Seek, to seek and find. Well, you don't seek something that is in front of you. You only have to seek for things that are hidden. So something has been hidden. And Jesus is telling us we need to look for it. And if we look for it, we know that it's a good thing that we're looking for it because we're told by Jesus that when we see Jesus, we see the Father. We know from the transfiguration that God said that this is his Son and he was well pleased in his Son. His Son is telling us to seek things out. So if he's pleased with his Son and his Son is telling us to seek things out, then just following that line of thought God would then be pleased with us for following the advice that his son was giving us to seek things out because in that process of seeking we find that which is hidden and therein is where you have the idea of if you have ears let you hear if you have eyes let you see understanding a deeper mystery that's involved so throughout time that's really been what we've been dealing with so we go back and we look at these stories that are in the Bible. It's quite possible that these stories are stories that are repackaged stories of events that occurred much earlier than the biblical stories. We're talking about a flood that occurred here 13,000 years ago, yet the Bible only goes back about 6,000 years. So there's a discrepancy of 7,000 years there. In the, what I just read to you, according to the timeline of Zechariah Stitchin, 400,000 years ago was when the Anunnaki first arrived. That's much, much earlier than anything of the biblical stories that we have. So we could see there's many discrepancies for us to come to understand. Okay, So that's the first point. Second point within this is something seems to be occurring that people are noticing more and more about this Niburu. It's been a discussion, a topic for quite some time. And one of the things that has been discussed as this gets closer 
is the effect that it has upon the earth now the effect that you know there's there's the talk about the gravitational pull i'm not sure if it's a gravitational pull because of all the things that we've studied that i've been talking about for the last couple of years i think there's a different connection i think there's an electromagnetic connection that's going on and this electromagnetic connection because we are beings that are electromagnetically connected are be are going to be affected when the electromagnetics are off and so as this planet gets closer to us and it and because it's such a large body much larger than Jupiter certainly much much larger than Earth it would be affecting the electromagnetic energy here well if we're operating and we're affected and part of this electromagnetic energy as we know we are because we have the positive and negative poles the masculine energy that goes back and forth if we're affected what are some of the things that are affected well we have the earth which is physically affected we're seeing more earthquakes we're seeing more tsunamis we're seeing more crazy weather patterns we have governments who want to attribute the weather to global warming but if this is because of another planet that is out there global warming would be off the table because you can't do anything to stop that so we have that issue if the electromagnetics are affecting us it's going to affect our brains we're seeing a time period where there seems to be a lot of insanity taking place right now in the earth and it seems to be getting more and more prevalent we're wondering why is this occurring why do people seem to be losing it these days why do we have so many things that seem to be backwards we have power struggles seems to be a little bit more tense than they have been in the past so I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest something is taking place now here is an article this is a very interesting article here it says astronomer exposes NASA cover-up claiming a second Sun and Nibiru are real and he did this during a broadcast a respected astronomer sensationally suggested NASA has been covering up the existence of a second Sun in our solar system and the fabled Nibiru planet during a live broadcast conspiracy theory websites have gone into overload following comments made by a seasoned astronomer Paul Cox during a live broadcast of Mercury transiting the Sun mr. Cox a presenter for the respected online slew telescope channel which broadcasts live shows to coincide with significant astronomical events made the comments his mercury was filmed as a tiny dot passing over the surface of the Sun Nibiru or planet X is an alleged huge planet with a vast orbit that conspiracy theorists claim will one day pass so close to Earth that its gravitational pull could break havoc on our planet triggering earthquakes and other catastrophic events believers in the conspiracy claimed they were right after NASA announced this new planet okay so what I want to do is I want to go to this clip right here and I'm gonna play a portion of this clip so you can hear what he is saying this is where he begins to speak about the second Sun okay so let me make sure the volumes not so loud that it blows your ears out all right He's just got done talking about Mercury, and now he's getting ready to go into this. So you may be asking yourself, what is that large round thing to the right of the sun? Well, that's our second sun. I don't know if you knew that we had a, a second sun, but uh, there it is. Uh, it's normally hidden from view. Uh, NASA and other organizations, they usually hide that stuff away from us. They don't tell us. Okay, so there you go. NASA hides that away. There was a second sun. So this was something that Paul Cox is very seasoned astronomer talked about and I know that you've looked at the SLU telescope before because I've talked about it and during different uh, events I've brought this up so you could see what it is and and uh, so on and so forth so here's a couple of videos where uh, they actually are showing different possible objects that could be Deburu here's one this guy Matthew Rogers here's an object here and a lot of times people want to chalk these up to lens flares but not everything's a lens flare you know there's some things out there that might be real so this is one of the things he captured right here okay I'm just gonna zip through these uh, here's another one 
This is from the sky cams, and you can see up here you got an object that sky cam is seeing. Again, you got people who are going to say, oh, just a lens flare, but is it really just a lens flare? When it's being seen in many different ways, here we have a airplane, and as it's moving over here, you can definitely see another object here. Okay, as it zooms in, is that a lens flare or is that something else up there? You see, it's moving the camera back and forth. The object still seems to be there. I don't know. Could be a lens flare, could not be. And then finally, here's one other. And this one is interesting because there's a filter on it, but you could see this object coming up here through this filter. So there's something there. And as we see this, we see an object that seems to have some sort of wings. It looks like what the traditional idea of Nibiru is. So, what's going on out there? You know, and these are just a couple of the videos out there on Nibiru. Do a YouTube search. Just type in Nibiru and look at how many videos and, and filter out. You know, so you're looking at the most current days within the last 24 hours. You will find that every day people are taking videos. But every day there's going to be people out there saying, nope, they're just lens flares. Well, they can't all be lens flares. Okay, the world is has too many people in it that are too intelligent that we've seen enough lens flares to know what they are. Of course, the debunkers are always going to say it's a lens flare and they're always going to dismiss it before they really know what's going on because that's just what people who debunk stuff do. It's just what they do. They, you know, no matter what you tell some people, no matter what evidence you present to them, they're still going to go ahead and they're still going to buy it. It's like with the election. No matter how many crimes you bring up against Hillary, no matter how much corruption she's been involved with, people are still going to go out there and still vote for her because they just don't care. It's a very bizarre event that takes place in the world. It happens over and over. It's like Obama. You know, all the stuff that's going on, all the evidence that people said about him early on was dismissed. And people said he's a Muslim, he's a terrorist, he wasn't born in America, he's not who we think he is. People dismissed it. But now all these years later, people are recognizing, hey, this is some truthfulness to it. Unfortunately, we didn't listen, and eight years has passed, and we're in the situation we're in now because we didn't listen. So, you know, could be another one of these situations. Something to listen to. All right, here's another article, what the church isn't telling you about Nibiru and the Anunnaki. This is from Greg Prescott at N5D. Silently, the Vatican is releasing information about Nibiru entering our solar system and extraterrestrial neighbors who have already met with Vatican officials. But they are not telling you everything. While the mainstream media remains conspicuously silent, while detracting our attention to idiotic events such as Justin Bieber's DUI, disclosure information has been slowly leaked by the Vatican indicating the presence of extraterrestrials on and visiting our planet along with an incoming anomaly called Planet X or Nibiru. The following testimonies confirm the Vatican's knowledge of extraterrestrial and Nibiru. Pierre Olena, a French astrophysicist and member of the Pontifical Academy, stated in November's 2009 Astrobiology Conference hosted by the Vatican that astrobiology is a mature science that says very interesting things that could change the vision of humanity has of itself. The Church cannot be indifferent to that. Chris Impey, a university distinguished professor and deputy head of the department, of the University of Arizona and a keynote speaker at the Astrobiology Conference added, the first discovery is only a few years away. Guy Cos Consul Ma Magano, Consul Magno, leading astronomer for the Vatican, stated, very soon the nations will look at aliens for their salvation. Consul Magno believes that humans are not the only intelligent beings created by God, in the universe and added that these non-human life forms are described in the Bible as the Nephilim. 
Dr. Christopher Corbelli, Vice Director of the Vatican Observatory Research Group on Mount Ram until 2012, who believes our image of God will have to change if its closure of alien life is soon revealed by scientists. Uh, the late Vatican Monsignor Corrado Balducci not only believed in the presence of alien intelligences already interacting with our planet, but also believed that the Vatican has been aware of it. Balducci believed that extraterrestrial contact is real and that extraterrestrial counters are not demonic. They are not due to psychological impairment. They are not a case of entity attachment, but these encounters deserve to be studied carefully. Balducci went on to state, as God's power is limitless, it's not only possible, but also likely that inhabited planets exist. I always wish to be the spokesman for these star people who are part of God's glory, and I will continue to bring it to the attention of the Holy Mother Church. Okay, now, here's an excerpt from an article entitled Exo Vatkina by Thomas Horn. In a paper for the Interdisciplinary Encyclopedia of Religion and Science, Father Giuseppe Tanzelaniti, an Opus Dei theologian for the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross in Rome, explains just how we could actually be invalid, invalid evangelized during contact with spiritual aliens, as every believer in God would, he argues, greet an extraterrestrial civilization as an extraordinary experience and would be inclined to respect the alien and to recognize the common origin of our different species as originating from the same creator. According to Giuseppe, this contact by non-extraterrestrial intelligence would then offer new possibilities of better understanding the relationship between God and the whole of creation. Giuseppe states that this would not immediately oblige the Christian to renounce his own faith on God simply on the basis of the reception of new unexpected information of a religious character from extraterrestrial civilizations, but that such a renunciation could come sooner after the new religious content originating from outside the earth is confirmed as reasonable and credible. Once the trustworthiness of the information has been verified, the believer would have to reconcile such new information with the truth that he or she already knows or believes on the basis of revelation of the one and triune God conducting rereading of the gospel inclusive of the new data. Now, in a 1997 interview with Art Bell in Coast to Coast AM, Father Malucci Martin, Malachi Martin, excuse me, was asked why the Vatican was heavily invested in the study of deep space at the Mount Graham Observatory. Martin replied, because the mentally mentality amongst those who are in the highest levels of Vatican administration and geopolitics know what's going on in space and what's approaching us. Could be of great importance in the next five to ten years. Reverend Jose Gabriel Funes, an astronomer and director of the Vatican Observatory, stated just as there is a multitude of creatures of Earth, there could be other beings, even intelligent ones, created by God. This does not contradict our faith because we cannot put limits on God's creation and freedom. Funes added, God was made. God was made man in Jesus to save us in this way if other intelligent beings existed it is not said that they would have need of redemption they could remain in full friendship with their creator all right so there's more to this article here you could see I'm gonna leave that to you to finish that up you see something's going on here right something's going on here with this planet Nibiru now over time I've talked and I've introduced a number of subjects from the non commodity library which certainly talk about the spiritual hierarchy in a different way than what we normally hear it. It is information that kind of rocks the boat. I've had numerous conversations with people about this and people get really, uh, their feathers really get ruffled when you bring up some of these subjects because they're so locked in to the actual words of the Bible that they can't look past that. Now, I believe that the Bible is a very important book filled with the inspiration of God. But as I said, that book was edited by men. And as we know, men can be corrupt and can find ways to remove God from a situation. Case in point, 
this day and age, 2016, where we see God being removed for so many things. So why is it so difficult to believe that back in 325 AD, when these men got together, that they decided that they were going to try to remove whatever concepts they could in order to confuse people? It's not really a stretch of the imagination. We understand history is written by the winners. So after Jesus was crucified, do we really think that these men got together and said, okay, now that we finally got rid of him, let's take all of his words and let's make sure the public gets these words so they understood everything he was saying. I don't think so. Because if that was the case, they would have just left him alive. But they didn't. They wanted to get rid of him. So probably when they got done, they probably wanted to strike his name from the records as best as they could. But there were so many people that were influenced and too many stories that were out there that they couldn't just strike his name from the record. So is it possible that they tweaked some of his words and manipulated some of the things? Quite possible. And I think that's where we have things like the Nag Hammadi Library and the Dead Sea Scrolls, the you know, information from the Qumran that have come forward, that have been found, discovered, that give us information about those times and those stories, which is a little bit different. And then we add into that mix all of the Anunnaki stories. Point being is, we can't get caught up in the concept of God simply as a physical being. Because if we do that, we're going to start looking to other physical beings to be the gods in our life. And that might not be the case. The Spirit of God is much bigger than anything that would be a physical representation, much greater than anything of that. In the Nag Hammadi Library, Yeshua describes this spirit as the mother, the father, this indestructible, inconquerable, uncorruptible spirit, this essence that is nameless, formless, beyond all things. Well, the stories that we have in the various books are all beings, beings who have claimed to be that ultimate source, but ultimately were not that ultimate source. Some of them had benevolent ways in manipulate or using that energy. Others were very manipulative in the way they wanted to use that energy. So I think we all need to keep that in perspective. So if something occurs that an extraterrestrial race makes itself known to us, we need to just keep in perspective who and what they are. They could very much be beings that are carrying with them this spirit of God. But to cl if they start claiming that that's who they are, I think maybe we need to start being a bit aware of that and cautious because God is beyond all physicalities. And I think that's important. So even you know if you read through the works of the, the Pleiadians, I'm going to play something from them right now. If you look through, they talk in their books how they are still on a quest to understand Prime Creator. That even as advanced as they are, they don't have all of the info. So they're still learning. So if they're learning and they talk of being 100,000 years in advance of us, well then our knowledge really isn't as much as we think it is either. You know, we only have a piece of the puzzle. And I think that's the biggest thing for us to understand. We really don't know. We only know what we think we know. We know what's written in the books. We have our understandings based on the words attributed to these various characters in the spiritual books. But other than that, we really don't know. And what we rely upon, other than those words in the books, is our personal experience. And through personal experience, I think we all have come to understand that in the universe there's love, there's opportunity to do good or to do bad. And as we go through life expressing love and using our energy to do good or bad, we make our way through life and we have different effects on different things. It's a very simple process once you look at it because it then becomes a cause and effect it becomes a reaction of 
chemicals or energy and that's why I always start every show talking about energy and my understanding and belief is that everything is energy and we're just learning how to work with it so when we look at things like the cards and we throw into the mix what we're doing is we're just looking at pictures that's all these are just pictures that represent ways in which energy is used there's nothing diabolical about this it's just a picture it's a picture of a man a hermit in a robe standing on a mountain holding a lantern that's it there's nothing sinister about that and it teaches us the wisdom because we can look at that and get meaning from that picture we all know the story the phrase pictures worth a thousand words that's it so if we get past and get over ourselves and get over our insecurities and all of our fears that someone's going to smack us down and punish us if we think the wrong thing and say the wrong thing I think we'll find ourselves being freed up to learn a lot more because we wouldn't be here in my opinion we wouldn't be here if there wasn't a purpose for us to be here and if we were really doing something wrong by questioning and if God was so upset with us for questioning things, I think we would have been smacked down a long time ago. But we're not. We seem to be encouraged. And the words that we have from Jesus are to seek and find, encouraging us to investigate, encouraging us to look deeper for the truths. Because the truths are here. The truths are inside. The truths are hidden. But once we find them, we understand what they are. We understand the great treasure that we have discovered in those truths. So, that is about Niburu. That's about the Anunnaki. Big story, a lot going on. If this was what the whole thing turns out to be, it would be pretty amazing. And it seems to be that things are playing out that we might see this occurrence between now and the end of the year. Last year, the Queen Elizabeth, she made a statement that that was the last Christmas. Very strange statement that she had made. There has been a number of instances that seem to indicate that before the end of the year, we're going to experience something pretty drastic. So maybe this distant Buru, maybe what people are seeing, these second sons, maybe this is exactly it. And, you know, now is the time of great change. One thing I know is we're all going to find out together because if this is real, then uh, we're all here. We're all going to know. It will not remain hidden for much longer. All right, here's the channel message I was speaking of. This is from the Pleiadian High Council of Seven. Good and bad, the Pleiadian High Council of Seven, channeled by Daniel Scranton. We are the Pleiadian High Council of Seven, and we are pleased to offer you our words of wisdom. If you are starting out with the premise that says, only those who are good get to have a good life, then you are going to look for ways that you can prove yourselves as good. This is something that has been sold to you by religion, and also by governments, parents, teachers, and anyone else who has ever assumed an authority figure role in your life. Being good means that you get the reward for being good. Being bad means that you get the punishment and no reward. So you definitely don't want to be bad, but then who gets to define what is good and what is bad? Well the ultimate authority for that would be the God that has been sold to you in religious dogma, but we can tell you that there is no judgment and that there is no list of rights and wrongs and dos and don'ts. Now you certainly do have karma, but karma is not punishment. And there is no being that is deciding that the good shall be rewarded and the bad shall be punished. And therefore, you don't need to worry about that. All you need to do is check in with yourself and determine for yourself whether you are expanding or contracting. If you are thinking about doing something, and you feel that contraction, that does not mean you are considering doing something that is ultimately <coughs> wrong. It may be wrong in the eyes of some. It may be that what you are considering is not going to get you what you want. It may be that the timing is not right. But if you are looking for a set of rules to live your life by, we would say that you must determine for yourself what your own rules are and then you must allow yourself to change those rules, bend those rules, 
and break those rules when appropriate. You are all making this up as you go, and you are all becoming more as you do. So the you that you are today is not the same you that you were five years ago, or even five minutes ago. Therefore, you must check in with yourselves to determine whether something is right or wrong <coughs> for you in any particular moment, and you must let everyone else decide for themselves as well if you ever truly want to live happily ever after. We are the Pleiadian High Council of Seven, and we are very fond of all of you. That is all. Okay, very good. So that's a very important message, you know? Very important message. It kind of goes along with everything I'm saying. We, we get so caught up in this concept of of God and that God's looking over our, over our shoulder, micromanaging every little thing that we do in life. And if we step out of line, that someone's there to smack us down. But that doesn't appear to be the case. We're here for a reason. God, in infinite wisdom, knows that we go through a learning curve, that we make mistakes. So would God put us here knowing that we're going to make mistakes and that when we make a mistake, smack us down, wipe us out of existence? That doesn't make sense. It doesn't sound like the loving Father that Jesus continually talked about. It seems to me that we are here with this loving Father, Mother, universal energy that is flowing through us that is here assisting us so that we can make decisions so we can evolve in life it seems that that is the opportunity and we get ourselves caught up in traps these earthly traps about how some we should believe and if we do something one way this is going to happen and if we do it this way this and i think we uh I think we are our own worst enemies at times, and we have to free ourselves up from that because God is so much more expansive than the limitations that we humans down here choose to put upon God. And I think that's what we're all eventually going to find out as we continue to move along, move along, move along. All right, here's our meditation. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Exhale. Take another breath. Exhale again. And another breath. And exhale. Now, let's imagine ourselves as a ball of energy. And as we feel this energy, we think about where this energy is coming from. And we look outside of ourselves, but we don't see the energetic connection coming from the outside. And we look inside and we see the energetic connection connecting us to something beyond this physical realm. And that we are simply projections from the invisible into this visible realm. And what we see around us in the outside world is the reflections. The movie that is playing from the inside to the out. So as we understand that this movie playing outside of ourselves is being reflected and shown from inside, we make our way to the in, inner planes to see behind the curtain, to see the process taking place, and there we discover universes upon universes, infinite planes of existence. And as we connect with this source of infiniteness, we find that we are at home, we are at peace, because we recognize this as the essence of who we are. We recognize our being as an extension of this. 
part of this, not separate from it. And so as we go through this day, we simply focus on our connection to all of this. Our connection to this energy, our connection to this source. Heavenly Mother, Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessings that you express into our lives this day, all days. We thank you for the blessings of love and light that we have available to share with others. We thank you for the wisdom with which we are able to move throughout world and continue to grow and evolve. We thank you for all of these blessings. And so much more. So let the subconscious mind continue moving on the journey to the day, this day. Focusing upon this connection to this ultimate source, this God source, this divine source. Let us just observe this connection, this connection from the inside out. And let's bring the conscious mind back to the present moment on the count of three. Three coming back to the present moment filled with confidence. Two coming back to the present moment filled with faith. And one coming back to the present moment happy, healthy, and whole. Happy, healthy, and whole. Take another deep breath. Exhale. And open your eyes. Alright, my friends. That is it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being here today. Lots of information, lots of links available, so you can go check them all out. Firstcontactradio.com. All kind of information about Nibiru. Check out those videos. See what you think. Some things may be lens flares. Other things may not be. They're not all lens flares. So we need to be discerning. We need to move past the skepticism that is out there and use our own innate understandings when we look at things. The world's going to continue to be filled with skeptics. And the skeptics are only going to be skeptical until something hits them from outside that is very extreme. An extreme understanding. But some people require that. And others, they understand it without having to go through those extreme experiences. Either way, we're all in this together, my friends, and we're all going to experience what life is bringing our way one way or another. So we might as well be open-minded to the process so that it goes smoother and we're not caught like a deer in the headlights when things do occur, especially when we've been told for such a long time that these events would be occurring in our lifetimes. It shouldn't be a surprise. We shouldn't be thrown off guard. We should simply be prepared mentally, spiritually, and even physically if need be to move through all of these changes that are coming our way. Thanks again for being here. Please check out all the links. If you like the show, please subscribe to the station. Pass it along. Share it. I've uh, got the Twitter. I've got the Facebook. All the different places where you connect with the show. Answer any questions, send me an email, firstcontactradio at yahoo.com. All that good stuff. All right, and have yourselves a great day. I'll be back tomorrow. We'll continue on. I'll maybe I'll bring some stuff about, uh, some more about the Anunnaki, get into them a little bit more, and some other good stuff. Till then, have an awesome day. I love you. Keep loving each other, and I will talk to you soon. Peace. I'm out of here.